My name is Jad Naus. I'm a partner at A16Z on the enterprise deal team. Prior to that, I was an architect at AppDynamics. And I've noticed this trend since my time there. And it's really accelerated more recently. And it's a second order effect, but it's an important one of the digital transformation. Oh yeah, boy, digital transformation. Well, it's happening. And it's really been accelerating more recently, but that's something else. So there's really two major components to the digital transformation. The first one is digitization. And that's when you move from paper processes or manual processes to processes that use digital forms or that are online. So for example, you can move from paper loan applications to digital loan forms that can be filled online. And that makes it much easier to change the process, add new fields, make it move faster. And then the second part is automation, uh, which is automatically collecting maybe the diligence that's needed once a form is submitted, querying some API service that cannot contact social security to get any information there that's needed or collects your credit history from the credit bureaus and then automatically executing pre-approvals perhaps without even necessarily needing humans in the loop. And so automate, this is all not new, but automation will change the structure of work, meaning what we do, how we do it. And that in turn is gonna end up needing new tools and that eventually is going to change how the market works, who wins, who loses, and why. So, like I said, nothing is new. But in this talk, I'll take a specific concrete look at how this impacts information workers in the enterprise and what that means to them. And then what kinds of opportunities that creates for startups. And so let's start with the structure of work. Yeah, you can think of the structure of work as being in three buckets. The first part is rote work, and that's tedious, kind of mindless work that ideally people wouldn't want to do. The second piece of it is uh, decision making, taking all the types of information that you can collect from your job or like from the root work itself and synthesizing decisions on what to do next, what to, how to execute a particular action, whom to talk to, making plans. The last bucket, and that's something that's really hard for machines to automate, is everything else, like all the creative work, all communications, coordination with people, things that machines can't do. With automation, this structure changes. So you move from rote work being a big chunk to being a small chunk, but you're still working eight hours a day, so you are doing a lot more of the other stuff, meaning the decision making and everything else. And so that means that you're gonna spend a lot more time in your day job making decisions, getting data, and trying to make the best decisions possible based on that data. Luckily, if you're already automating, then you're also digitizing. And that makes it much easier to get the data that you need to make good operational decisions because, as I said before, digitization makes processes much more observable. So to make this more concrete, let's go through an example. Back in the day, product managers used to spend a ton of time doing customer surveys, uh, talking to customers about problems that they have, trying to figure out which bugs to fix, what features they want, and so on. That took a ton of time. Today, they can use tools like Mixpanel or Amplify to actually see the customer journey within the product and understand where their customers are getting stuck, and then identify those as bugs or uh, features that need to be fixed, and then prioritize them based on information from the CRM about which customers are the highest value. And so once they do that, they can even roll out the changes to specific sets of customers using continuous delivery to, and run A-B tests on those fixes to see if those fixes actually fix the customer problems. All that without actually talking to the customers themselves. And so they moved from spending a ton of time doing manual data collection to more time analyzing the data and synthesizing actions. Let's take another example. This is a story about marketing. So in the good old days, people relied on intuition. They used to run focus groups. They used to come up with creative stuff that they might want to try out. They'd spend a bunch of time and a bunch of money trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. What we see now is the rise of the growth hacker. Growth hackers are these types of people who are half engineers and half marketers. They use their engineering capabilities to look at data and uh, construct experiments to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And they use their marketing creativity to figure out what experiments to run. And so what they do is they run these experiments, they figure out what works, they expand the ones that are working and pump more money into it. And then they kill off and prune off all the experiments that don't work. That leads to systematic success. And this trend is actually happening everywhere. 
we see it happen by role, by sales, customer success, engineering. We see it also happen by industry, construction, manufacturing, groceries, etc. It's impacting the work of the op operational folks, not just the executives, the bulk of the organization. These are operational people. And so everyone is, in short, becoming an analyst, an operational analyst, because they're the operational people. So we talked about how work is going to change, how everyone is becoming an analyst because they're going to be doing a ton more decision making and using data to actually do those decisions. So what does that mean? How is that going to change the technology and the tools that we need? So what are the tools of trade for these new operational analysts? Well, you can say maybe we should use Hadoop or BI. Unfortunately, these are kind of older generation tools. They require specialized skills and abilities to be able to use them. And so they need armies of analysts to use. These are really only affordable for a certain type of decision and a certain type of questions or a certain type of user. So really, they're affordable only to the execs in an org because they're asking these types of long-term uh, strategic questions where the answer can come back in three months and that's okay. The rest of the org is really underserved. This does not work for the operational people who need to make day-to-day -day decisions. The needs of these new analysts, the operational analysts, are different. They are not just about high-level decisions, like what market should I enter next, but about operational day-to-day -day questions, like are the customers in my test rollout using the new features I just released, and if not, which ones aren't and are they getting stuck and where? And back in the day, or with executives, they were fine with getting answers that were eventual or maybe based on data that might be a few months old. But three months is, is too late. What operational analysts need are immediate answers. They need to know right now whether or not to respond to a competitor's flash sale and what segments of their customers to target to make sure to not lose any customers. And it's moving from full service where analysts intermediate between the, uh, the user of the data and the data itself to self-service where the operational person goes and uses those tools to get the insights that they need. And so what this really tells us is that there's a new category of tools that's needed. It's a tool for operational workers to observe and act on their own data. These are operational analytics tools. So we talked about this new need new types of tools that are operational, immediate, and self-service. So let's talk about how this is changing the world and what opportunities exist in this new world. So the first opportunity is software eats tech-phobic industries. So have you noticed recently, like there's a bunch of tech companies that are competing in traditionally tech-phobic industries. So for example, in transportation, we have Uber and Lyft beating out old taxis. We've got Airbnb and Sonder competing with hotels. We've got uh, Samsara and Turvo competing with a whole bunch of companies in logistics. And on freight, we've got Flexport. And these are all tech-focused companies. They're not just winning because of the better user experience. They're also winning because they have the intelligence to beat the incumbents at their own game. And that's the first opportunity in operational analytics, which is building a vertically integrated tech company to compete in these spaces and winning. The recipe to winning here is pretty simple. First, choose a tech-phobic industry. Second, provide a digital user experience. Finally, use operational analytics to create efficiencies. You undercut the existing players with lower pricing, and then you build an operational mode to make sure that you're continuously winning against any competitors. So great, all these tech companies win because they have operational analytics. So Facebook has uh, Scuba, Google has Dremel Rasta and a whole bunch of others. Airbnb built Superset, Uber built AresDB. What about the rest of the world? That is the next set of opportunity. So these next opportunities are all about enabling other companies to win with operational analytics. The first one is on the infrastructure layer. Say we need a new presentation layer to make it easy for non-technical people to actually access data and insights. Or we need a new processing layer that can be uh, reconfigured by non-technical people to actually generate insights that are specific to their domains. The next opportunity is building operational analytics applications that focus on specific industries. So providing insights that cater to those specific industries like manufacturing, mining, construction, groceries, and so on. And so one example here is potentially mapping the actual progress in construction to the construction plans using machine learning. That's a company called Doxel that's doing that. 
or the ability to do well optimization or like optimizing the production in a well in oil and gas. And that's a company called Kelvin that's doing that. Finally, the last opportunity is in building operational analytics that caters to specific roles like sales or marketing or operations, management, and so on. So helping uh, customer success people predict when customers might churn, for example, or helping them figure out what the right actions to take to make a sale happen. So let's focus on the infrastructure side for a second. Every single layer will need to refocus on being operational, immediate, and self-service. So ETL, storage, processing, analytics, access, and presentation, all those layers are going to need to be redone in order to get to operational analytics. Let's focus on ETL for a second. Everyone working with data knows how terribly hard and horrendous it is. Raw data can come from anywhere. It can look like anything. It might have different shapes over time. It might have missing data. It might have wrong data. It might have different words that mean the same thing. We still need new tools to make working with raw data easy. And there's a bunch of uh, machine learning companies that are focused on solving this problem, but this is still not yet solved. Another layer that needs to be fixed is the access layer. And that's mainly the sec where security lives. When everyone in a company wants access to data, it's going to be really hard for a central IT department to manage all those requests. They're going to need some way to uh, enforce an automatic policy that allows companies to say who can see what data and when without exposing them to any privacy risks. And so how do these operational analytics infrastructure companies win? First, you got to remember who your users are. These are operational folks. These users are not executives. And so the tools that they use have to be self-service and they have to be easy to use. So you can't build something that requires an intermediary between them and the insights. The second piece is that uh, operational people adopt organically. They don't like to be sold to. So to win, you have to get them to start adopting your tools organically. And that's by providing easy, small bites of the product that they can use. And then you can layer on sales top down to drive revenues. And with that, the primary KPI to measure is user engagement. How many operational people are actually using your stuff? Revenues, on the other hand, is a lagging indicator. So some companies in this bucket are uh, Imply, Databricks, and Sisu. Let me focus on Imply for a minute. Imply is the company behind the insanely popular Druid OLAP database. That's an open source database. So they use the open source as their growth engine. They used it as the organic adoption engine. And then as a company, they provide an application that can do streaming interactive analytics on real-time data. They're used in clickstream and behavioral data analysis. They're used in, in fraud detection. They're used in troubleshooting and monitoring and a ton of many other uh, situations. And so the open source was just the organic growth motion. And then they used that as lead gen to close deals. All right, so that was infrastructure. Let's look at applications that are industry focused. The biggest impact for operational analytics is going to be in obviously operationally intensive industries. So what do I mean by that? There's two kinds. First one is those are high capex capital expenditure industries like oil and gas, manufacturing and mining. These are uh, industries whose primary business metric or business KPI is called ROS, the return on capital expenditure. And where improving the returns on capital even slightly amounts to huge returns or huge increases in revenue. The second type of those businesses is low margin businesses, so like groceries and construction. In these uh, types of businesses, gross margin is, is low, and that's, the primary, that's one of the primary KPIs to monitor as that business. Just reducing the cost of labor or cost of goods sold in these businesses, even slightly, ends up making a huge impact to the bottom line. And so how do you build a company that wins here? Well, first, you got to build an end-to-end -end domain-specific product. What this means is that the product that you build should be easy to adopt for your customers without them having to learn or do a ton of integrations. For these companies, it's really hard to find internal resources that would do any additional work in order to gain value. You got to build what Bill Davido calls the whole product. The next thing that you need to do is build domain expertise so you can shore up your credibility when you talk to customers. And you also have to prepare for these long, heavily consultative educational sales. 
So you'll want to build a strong professional services org that can take your customers to success without them having to find or, or understand how your product works and integrate it with their internal tools. You got to do all this for them. Finally, you really have to speak to the KPIs that these businesses care about, either gross margins or return on capital. If your product doesn't have a clear path from what you're doing to the impacts that you're providing to those KPIs, it will be a very tough sale. Some examples of these companies are Samsara, Afresh, and Kelvin. Spend just uh, 30 seconds on Samsara. This is an example of a company that's doing this for logistics and transportation. So they go to transportation companies that run fleets and help them run and manage those fleets uh, optimally, optimize routes, uh, increase utilization, and so on. And so with that, they help these transportation companies increase their ROS uh, by making their vehicles much better utilized and increase their gross margins by uh, making sure that their drivers are fully utilized and they're not sitting idle. So that was uh, industry-focused operational analytics. Let's look at role-focused operational analytics as the last uh, possible opportunity here. Role-focused operational analytics are probably the most popular area for operational analytics companies. These are companies that target specific roles within an enterprise like sales or customer success or engineers or product managers or whatever. There is usually a much lower barrier to entry into these spaces, uh, which means that those spaces are usually going to be filled with noise or there's going to be at least fast followers behind you. And so with that said, the recipe to win here is to first find the right role to go after in the enterprise. That's usually one where either it has been traditionally underserved by technology or by products, or where tools have been traditionally pushed top down from the IT department to those users instead of them being organically adopted. And so then you should use your initial technology and product advantage to build your brand as a moat. So that brand is going to be very important for you as a moat because this space has a low barrier to entry, which means that you need to build the brand to protect yourself from any fast followers. Finally, you got to remember uh, that you, you're solving those problems for a particular role in the company. So go for depth, don't go for breadth. Make sure that you solve all, all problems for that role. Make sure you make those people extremely successful. And only then should you go to any adjacent spaces or any adjacent roles. So some examples here, mixed panel, signal effects, and people.ai. So one minute on people.ai. So people.ai records all interactions between salespeople and customers, and they build a graph of buyers and the interactions between sales customers and those buyers that led to actual sales. So the salespeople can then use that graph to figure out how to structure a sale, whom to talk to, what process, what steps to take to close a sale, and what needs to happen to win that sale. So that's really operational analytics for salespeople. Operational analytics is changing how people work. It's already made things like Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, and Google happen. How else is it going to change the world? How do you think it has impacted your work? Thank you for listening.